We come now to the reading and preaching of God's Word, and we continue our walk through the book of Matthew, coming this morning to Matthew chapter 7, where we're looking at verses 12 through 14. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find us on page 812. Now before we actually hear God's Word read, and hear God speak to us through His preached Word, I invite you to join me in prayer, asking that God will have us hear that which He has for us this morning. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before you this morning, thanking you and praising you, that you speak to us in a special way through your preached word. So we ask, Lord, you might do that for us this morning. Help us, Lord, through this very brief text of scripture to see how you're setting before us life and death and urging us, Lord, to choose life. May we do just that. Lord, be with me, your servant. Let the words I speak be the words you've given to edify your people to build them up and strengthen them, and to turn hearts to yourself. Lord, we ask these things in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, a text that shows you got a choice to make, and Christ is urging you to choose life. So hear now God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Matthew chapter 7, beginning of verse 12. So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I want you to imagine you're driving down the road and you come to a fork. There's only one of two ways you can go. You gotta either go to the left or go to the right. And as you survey the situation, you notice if you go to the left, it seems kind of narrow, more difficult, not an easy way to go. But to the right, it's wide, it's bright, it seems like a very easy path, almost like an obvious choice, particularly because there seems to be a lot of people walking on it and going that way. So as you come to this fork in the road, what do you do? Which way do you go? The problem we have is we face these forks in life all the time and we're so inclined to take the wide and easy path. Because we never stop to consider where it leads to, where it winds up. That's what Christ is trying to help us to see this morning. He's showing you got a choice to make. And he knows the problem we have is often we choose without considering the eternal destination. And so we go the wide and easy path. And that's why he's teaching his disciples and all of us here this morning that you need to consider the path that you choose and where it goes. There may be a harder path, a more narrow gate, but he's saying that's the one to take. Don't take the wide gate and easy path, he's saying, because where it leads. It leads to death and destruction. But the narrow gate, which is Christ himself, leads to life. And that's what Christ is urging you to do. He's saying you got to choose, and he's urging you to choose life. So let's do something this morning. Let's walk through this very brief text. And here's what I want you to see this morning. I want you to see first, treat others like you. Second, you need to choose. And third, choose the narrow gate. And this brings us to our big idea. I want you to hear these words, get them down. Let this cause you to be a little bit more intentional when you make these choices. Here's your big idea. Choose the narrow gate and find life. So first, treat others like you. You ever get upset because you're not being treated fairly? People aren't treating the way you think you should. Whether it's your spouse, your boss, your parents, you're thinking, they're not doing for me what they ought to be doing. Not treating me the way I think they should. That make you upset? Get you a little bit angry? It kind of does that, right? But do you ever have the same thought when you're not treating somebody the way they should be treated? When you're treating them poorly? Do you feel guilty? Do you feel wrong when you're sneaking out of work early? Forgetting your spouse's birthday? Not keeping a promise to your child? Does that get you the same upsetness when someone doesn't treat you the way you want to be treated? We don't have the same attitude with that, do we? We seem to think that if people don't treat us fairly, that's a big problem. But if we don't do it, we seem to almost excuse it away. Like, I meant to do well, I just forgot, no big deal. Give me a little bit of grace. That's why Jesus is making clearer. 
We need to think about how we treat others. That ought to be first and foremost on your mind. Not how you're treated, but how you treat others. And he's driving home, treat others like you. Look how your text begins. Look at verse 12. It begins, it says, so. Just one word that Jesus starts with. And it shows he's connecting this section with everything that's come before. And not just the prior verses. Not just 7 through 11. And even not just chapter 7. But he's showing right here with this so, that it is the ground, the reason, he's, everything he's going to say from this point forward is he's wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount. And he's saying what he's about to say from this week through the balance of chapter 7 is all grounded in what came before throughout the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. What's he been doing on the Sermon on the Mount? He's been teaching about what it looks like to engage in kingdom living. And that's a pretty high standard. He's showing you what you need to do and how you can only do it through Christ. And this so is showing that. Kind of connecting it all together. And you're going to see, as you get to the end of verse 12, how he shows even for how you're to treat others like you. But for now, I want you to see something. He's showing that you need to think differently about how you live. Not putting a focus on yourself, how people treat you, whether you're being treated fairly or not, but asking a different question. Are you treating others like you want to be treated? What's your perspective? He's saying, treat others like you. Look how verse 12 continues. Look what it says here. Whatever you wish that others would do to you. This is pushing us closer to see how he's driving home that idea, treat others like you. But you need to note something. Notice that word that begins this section. It says, whatever. He's not saying, carte blanche, you can have whatever you desire, whatever your heart wants. That's not what's in view here with whatever. It's conditioned. It's the idea that there's your will should match God's will. Otherwise, it would make no sense. He'd be saying, what you want is primary. Think how disastrous that would be if you had to give everybody what they wanted, what they thought they needed, what they thought they desired was what they thought best. Often, we don't know what we want or what we need. Our hearts are wicked and deceptive. Who can trust them? So he's saying, condition, not that whatever, but make it the idea that what is God's will? What's God's desire? That's the whatever. See, to do otherwise would open up a floodgate of sin. People would just be doing whatever they want all the time. And that would be disastrous. That's why he's saying the so is grounded in everything that's come before. So whatever you ask is going to be consistent with what God wants you to ask. Consistent with his will. The whole Sermon on the Mount is about kingdom living. That's what the book of Matthew is about. What it looks like to live in God's kingdom. And what is he saying here? you got to think differently. Stop going the easy way and saying, how do people treat me? But think about how you treat them. Because when you do that, he's saying what you want to do is choose life. When you do that, you treat others like you. Look how verse 12 goes on. Do also to them. This makes clear, drives home, concretizes that idea that you're to treat others like you. Look at the words all together again. Look what he says here. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do to them. I don't know if you realize this, but this is groundbreaking. You realize how groundbreaking this is? Every major religion in all of world history has had this same idea, this similar concept, the same sort of view, except with a key difference. They always frame it in the negative. What you don't want someone to do to you, don't do to them. But now Jesus, for the first time in all of history, is saying something different. He's not saying, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. But he's saying, do to others what you want them to do to you. This is the idea of show others the same grace, mercy, love, forgiveness that you want them to show you. That's almost countercultural and counterintuitive, isn't it? We don't naturally think that way, do we? We're more focused on ourselves and how we should be treated. I mean, think about it. Aren't we inclined to unfriend somebody on our Facebook page because they post a view that we disagree with? And it could be something ridiculous. It could be something like, can you believe they had the audacity to say that hamburgers are better than hot dogs? I can't be friends with somebody like that. That's it. They're gone. We tend to do that, right? Instead of saying, well, what do I want them to do? How would I want them to be, how would I want them to be treated? Let me treat them the same way I want to be treated. That's the idea. Treat them, do to them what you want them to do to you. Isn't that just what Jesus does for you? Think about it. Jesus knows your spiritual state. He knows your sin. He knows how you're prone to go astray. But what's he want? He wants you to be forgiven. So what's he do? He secures your forgiveness. 
That's why he's born of a virgin. That's why he walks in perfect obedience to the law. That's why he goes to the cross as your once for all perfect atoning sacrifice. He sheds his blood to cleanse you, to make you new, so you can come into God's presence and be adopted. Think about that. So often, we feel all alone. Nobody understands what I'm going through. You ever feel that way? Like you're struggling all by yourself and nobody can possibly understand what you're going through? Well, Jesus Christ does. Because Hebrews 4.15 says, He's tempted in every way like you are, yet without sin. And because He's without sin, He can accomplish your redemption. That's why God raised Him from the grave, has Him ascend on high, where He takes a seat at the right hand of God, where He continues to intercede for you so He can do for you what He wants done for you. That's the idea. And He says, you need that. Because He puts before you Death and life. And he wants you to choose life. And for that to happen, you need Christ to indwell you through his spirit. See, through his birth, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, he secures your redemption. That's what makes all the difference for you. That's how you can go forth and treat others like you. On your own, you'd never do it. You just cry and complain about your rights, what you want, and how unfairly you're being treated. But when Christ indwells you through his spirit, you're made new. Now you can live differently. You can actually choose life and see this earthly life is not what it's all about. There's so much more. That's why he sends the spirit to indwell you. So you're equipped, enabled, and empowered to do as he says. To go forth and choose life. See, God works that salvation through you so you can respond. We don't choose God. He chooses us and we respond. And that means you can then do as the law requires. That's how verse 12 ends. Look how it ends. It says, For this is the law and the prophets. This shows you so clearly. Treat others like you. Because why? Look at your text. It says for. Why do you do this? Because it's what the law requires. Notice the text again. For this is the law and the prophets. This is giving you the whole reason why you treat others the way you want to be treated. Because of what God's word requires. When you see in Matthew this use of this phrase, law and prophets, or he might say law, writings, and prophets, he always has in mind the same idea. And that's the entirety of the Old Testament. Who is Jesus speaking to right here? He's speaking to Jews. They're the disciples. That's who he's speaking to. And he's saying... All the Old Testament, the entirety, commands you to do what God is saying right here. To treat others like you. It's the same thing that Jesus says in Matthew 25, 35 to 40, where he sums up all the law. He quotes two verses there. Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. And what does Deuteronomy 6, 5 say? It says you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. God is first in your life. And then the second greatest commandment, Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the law requires. That's the idea of treat others like you. That's what you're seeing. It's the idea of doing like Paul says in Philippians 2, 3. Look at others and consider them more significant than yourselves. When you do that, then how you think you're being treated is unfair quickly fades away. Because you're saying, how am I treating others? That's primary. And that's what happens when you choose life. Because it changes your perspective. Changes who you are. Shows you. You've been united to Jesus Christ through God's work. Through that spirit wrought union. Why? Because like he's telling you here. Like you're going to see in a moment. Because he brings you through the narrow gate. And the narrow gate is Jesus Christ himself. That's what's in view. See, you'd never love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Never love your neighbors yourself unless God first loved you. And that's what he does. Think about how amazing that is. Let that really sink in. Despite your sinfulness, despite your wickedness, despite your selfishness, God loves you and he chooses you. He unites you to himself. Knowing that, how could you walk around complaining about how it's not fair, I'm not getting what I want? That's almost ridiculous, right? What is God showing? He wants you to choose life because you've been converted, made new through the work of Jesus Christ. That's the idea. Jesus never tells you something to do that he doesn't first do for, do for you himself. Think about it. What's he do? He dies so you might live. He doesn't just tell you to live for him. He first dies and sends a spirit so you can do just that. He lives for you and dies for you so you can live for him and die in him. That's the idea. 
Understand, this life is not about you. I know it's hard to hear. I know it's shocking. What do you mean it's not all about me? Well, it's not. It's about giving glory to God, seeing Christ highly exalted, seeing the Spirit accomplishing God's purposes through you. See, the reality is this. We are so focused on temporal earthly delights and delicacies that we miss the bigger picture, miss it where we're headed, where the gate leads to. And that's why he's saying, you got two choices before you, and he wants you to choose life. So why not do just that? Choose the narrow gate and find life. So you're facing a choice, which means a choice has to be made, which brings us to our second point. You need to choose. You ever find somebody, see somebody, who just can't make a decision? They're usually the person right in front of you, in front of the counter, right? Like they're standing there, and it's like, huh, do I want this? I don't know, maybe this. Wait, 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 what's that? And you're thinking, it's just a donut already, just pick one and go. It's not that complicated. Do you ever think of the time and attention people give on temporal earthly choices and decisions? We sometimes give more thought to what we're going to eat for lunch than how our consequence, the consequence of decisions we make. Do you ever stop to think about eternal consequences to words you speak, actions you take? Do you give as much thought to that as you do where you're going to go on vacation? But here's the reality. Where you're going on vacation doesn't matter anywhere near as greatly as where you're going to spend eternity. We need to think differently. Think a little bit more differently about the gates we choose. Which one we're going to walk through. Which path we're going to take. So you've got two gates before you. That's what Christ is laying out here. Making that clear. And he's saying he wants you to choose life. Choose the narrow gate. Choose wisely. And he helps you to do just that. Because as you look at the rest of this text, he's going to show you why the choice is so obvious why you want to choose the narrow gate. It's kind of like working in, walking into Jersey Mike's and I get all those sandwiches, you don't know which one to get. And someone says, get the number 17, you'll love it, it's great. They kind of help you out. Well, he's doing the same thing, he's saying, you got two gates, choose the narrow one, that's the right one, it won't go wrong with that. That's what he's laying out. How do you see this? Jesus is showing you choose life. Look at verse 13. Look how he begins. Enter by the narrow gate. With these words, this straightforward declaration He's showing you how you need to choose. And by saying, enter by the narrow gate, he's making it clear there's a choice to make. I mean, think about it. If there's a narrow gate, what does that imply? What does that mean? There must also be some other gate. He wouldn't say take the narrow gate if that's the only gate. He'd just say take the gate. But the fact he says narrow gate means there must be a wide one as well. And so he's giving you two options. And here's the thing. The one he tells you to go through seems like the more difficult choice because look what it says, it's a narrow gate. If it's narrow, what's that indicate? It's harder to find and harder to get through. The wide gate, that seems easier. You'll see that in a second. But what's he showing right here? He's saying you have to choose. And this is the same thing you see in the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. Because God before his people, Israel, enter into the promised land, what's he do? He sets before them the same choice, life and death. Deuteronomy 30:19. We read this earlier. What's it say? I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. And to choose life means to choose Jesus Christ. How do you know this? Both Deuteronomy 30, verse 20, and John 14, 6 say the same thing. Jesus is the life. And that shows the gate that Jesus urges you to enter through, that narrow gate, is Jesus Christ himself. And he makes this clear by his own words in John 10, 9, where Jesus says, I am the gate. Now that doesn't mean Jesus is an actual literal gate with hinges on his back. That's not what he's saying. He's speaking metaphorically. He's showing he's the gate you enter through if you want to find life. He's saying he opens up access to God. You've got to go through him. Nobody can get to God apart from Jesus Christ. That's the idea. Life only comes through Jesus Christ, who is the narrow gate. That's why he stresses, enter by the narrow gate. He's showing he's the one who opens up access to God. That's how you get to God, through Christ. That means you need to choose. And how you choose has eternal consequences. So don't just look at what seems easier, but ask a different question. Where does it lead? 
What are the consequences of this decision? What will I face in the future? Because the reality is, the choice is a hard one when you look at just the circumstances. Verse 13 shows us. Look, what it, look how it continues. It says, For the gate is wide. This makes so clear that you need to choose. And it shows you clearly you got two gates. One that's narrow and one that's wide. And once again you see a four. And this four is cluing you in to why Jesus is urging you to choose life, to choose the narrow gate. He's showing, he's going to see in a moment, how the wide gate seems more appealing. But for now I want you to think about these two gates. Think about it. Just try and picture it in your mind. you got two gates. One that's narrow and the other that's wide. And it seems the wide gate might seem to be the better choice. It may be more appealing. Because more people can get through it. More people are on that path. Think about a wide gate. Isn't it easier to find than some narrow gate? Think about losing your wedding ring and losing your cell phone. Which is easier to find? That wedding ring can hide in all kinds of crevices and cracks. The cell phone is kind of bigger, easier to find, and you can always call it and hear it ring. He's saying it's kind of a similar illustration with the narrow gate and the wide gate. The wide gate's easy. It stands out. You can see it. Narrow gate, you got to look for. A little bit harder to find. It takes a little more effort. But what's he showing? That the narrow gate may be the way to go. Think about going down the turnpike or the parkway and they have construction going on and so three lanes merge into one. That may seem harder to sit in that traffic, right? But the road's closed off for a reason because there's a big ditch in the side and you see people on the right, they're just flying down in the shoulder, right? You ever see that? You're thinking, maybe I'll follow them. And what happens? They run right off the ditch. That's the idea. He's saying it's safer to take the harder way to choose the narrow gate. Maybe more difficult, but it's the way to go. Don't follow where everyone else is going just because it seems easier. That's the idea. The wide gate may seem more convenient and easier to take, but it's not the way to go. And you see this. You see why it's a hard, what's well, easier choice to make. Verse 13 goes on. Look what it says. And the way is easy. This shows why you have to choose and why in life it's so difficult to choose the right way. Because the wide way is the easy way. You get that? Look at that language again. You got this choice, a narrow gate and a wide gate that's got a way that's easy. Does that seem more appealing? I mean, doesn't that seem like the way to go? Isn't that kind of a no-brainer choice? I got this wide gate that leads this easy path and everyone's on it. Why would I not go that way? I mean, after all, you don't wake up in the morning and pray you'll have problems, do you? God, send me a bunch of problems today, make my life difficult and more, more complicated. We don't do that, do we? We tend to search out things that make our life easier. Seems like the more difficult choice is not the right choice. We're so inclined to go the easy way. And that's what he's laying out here, the wide gate that leads to the easy way. And often that's what we face. And that's what you're going to think about. Don't just ask yourself the question, what will make my life easier on this earthly existence? But ask a different question. What's going to have a greater benefit in the long run? What may be more difficult today but make life easier in the future? What might be the better choice? See, often we choose the easy way because we think there's no fuss, no fighting, no losing of friends and relatives, everybody treats me well, why not go that way? Why not choose that way? It's a wide gate, easy way, everybody's on it. Let me just walk that way for a while. Doesn't it make most sense to do that? Well, Jesus makes clear why that's not the way to go. He's laying out, it may seem like it offers an easier ride, it might get there quicker, but look where you're headed. He's showing how it's dangerous and destructive. That's why he's urging you to choose life. And he lays out what you see right here. Look what he says about this gate. Look at verse 13, how it goes on. It says what? Wide is the gate, easy is the way, that leads to destruction. You hear that language? That leads to destruction. This shows you why you need to choose and why you need to be a little bit more careful about how you choose and what you choose and why you choose. He wants you to choose life. Because the wide and easy way leads to destruction. And the word destruction here, in the Greek, it has this connotation of eternal loss. It's referring to hell, burning for all eternity. You may think choosing a wide gate and easy way is the way to go, but look at the final destination. It means you will burn for all eternity. So Christ is urging you, don't go that way. Choose life. See, if you choose the wide gate and easy way, Know what your end's going to be. But sadly, so many people wind up just this, this way. And you know why? 
because they don't know any better. And they don't know any better because they're just following the crowd, just going along with everybody else. And sadly, even going along with so many Christian friends and relatives who refuse to speak up and share the truth of the gospel with them. Making the same sinful choices, walking the same wide path without ever considering the consequences of doing so. Never talking about who Jesus is, how he's the gate that leads to life. So many people miss this because they're focused on their good, their future, their future here on earth. Focused on getting ahead in life, enjoying the world's delicacy and delights, making life easier, easier choices. They never stop and search out or ask the question, why did Jesus have to be born of a virgin? Do you ever stop and ask that question? Could you answer that question if somebody asked you that? Why does it matter that Jesus is born of a virgin? Why do you have to walk a life of perfect obedience? How can Christ's death on the cross satisfy my sin? Can you answer that question for somebody? Do they even know why? See, people don't ask these questions. They're focused on temporal things like which donut to pick. Like that's more important. Where am I going to go on vacation? Like that's got greater value. But you need to be thinking differently. Thinking eternally. Ask yourself. Do you share with people why it's significant that Jesus rose from the grave? What that means. What it means when he says he conquered sin and death. Do you know how can you be a sinner and yet Christ conquered sin? Can you answer those questions? You ought to be able to do that because you see God's word shows that. And you know that when you choose life because God has chosen you first. That's why you choose life. Why does it matter Christ ascended? Why do you have to ascend? Because the Spirit can't descend unless Christ first ascends. And He does that so the Spirit can indwell you, change you, make you new, change your thinking, help you to think differently about choices you make. Not just seeing what's going to make my life easier. How do I avoid the traffic? But rather asking, what's the final destination? Understand something. We need to think more seriously about the significance of choosing to share or not share your faith. You realize that has great eternal consequences? Every time you choose to stay silent, not share the truth of the gospel, people aren't hearing the truth. And how are they going to hear it if you don't speak it? That's the reality. Do you ever think about the consequences others face because of your choices? Because you choose to walk with them on that wide and easy path, never saying to them, this is the wrong path, we need to get off of it? That's got a consequences for them. Never let us be so complacent in our salvation we say, well, I know where I'm going, so I'm okay, it's good to go. Let us be more concerned about others. Let us do for them what we want them to do for us. And if you're on the wrong path, when you want someone to say to you, get off that path that leads to destruction, you'd want that to happen, right? Well, why not do that for others? Treat them like you. Help them to see you need to choose and help them to choose wisely. Because here's the reality. People choose that wide path because they don't know any better. Otherwise, it'd be totally ludicrous. Because look what it says. It leads to destruction. But, this text goes on to show, many people are on just that path. Look how verse 13 ends. Look what it says. And those who enter it are many. This shows you. You've got two gates. A narrow gate and a wide gate. The narrow one and the wide one. The narrow path, the wide path. And Jesus is saying, you need to choose. So what will you do? Will you choose life? Understand, this is speaking both eternally and temporally. It's not as though you walk through the gate and that's it, you're done. Every day of your life, you face choices. You got these forks in the road. Are you going to take the narrow gate or the wide gate? And you got to decide what to do. And it always seems the wide gate is the more reasonable option because it's easier. It seems like it's a way to go and everyone else is on it. Understand something though. Every time you make a choice to say something or not say something, to do something or not do something, it shows which path you're on. It shows what gate you've walked through. It speaks loud and clear to what you're truly trusting in. What do you choose? So let me ask you, what do you choose? Do you choose food or fellowship? Do you choose sleep or sanctification? Do you choose having your rights met or seeing God's righteousness fulfilled? What matters most to you? What do you choose? If you want to choose rightly, then you choose the narrow gate. You choose life. That's what you see right here. Because again, the choices you make 
are a pretty good indication of the path that you're on. See, it's easy to say I'm a Christian. It's a lot harder to live it out, to stay off that wide path and to choose the narrow gate. And what you see right here. You know the wide gate, easy path leads to destruction? But look what it says. Those who enter it are many. Does that seem kind of insane, almost crazy-like? You know if you go this way, you're going to die. But yet, how many people choose it? How about you here this morning, who have been united to Jesus Christ? How many times do you choose to close your Bible and not read it to watch something on TV? Seems kind of crazy, right? The words of life are right here. Who God is, what He requires is right here, and yet we close the Bible. How many times do you choose to do something and not go to prayer time at the church? Seems almost crazy, right? But yet we choose it. We choose sleep over sanctification and think, that's okay, I need my sleep. I need my beauty sleep, I won't be so beautiful. But God is saying, He wants to cleanse you and purify you, change you. And that's what He does through Christ. Think about what you see in the book of Judges. A whole generation that grows up not knowing the Lord. You know why? Because you have a whole generation before them that does what's right in their own eyes. You know what that is, to do what's right in your own eyes? To make the choices that seem most obvious, that are easiest. To choose the wide gate and the easy way. Like, that's the way to go. That's the way for me. But you need to stop and think. What happens when you choose what's right in your own eyes? That may seem like the easier way to go. But what's the better way to go? When you're struggling through Scripture, you think it makes most sense to figure it out by yourself, or maybe speak with God's ordained leaders who maybe, just maybe, might know a thing or two more than you. Or do you think, no, 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 there's no way. I know, I can read, I got God's Word all figured out. Why would I trust somebody who's been seminary trained? So what's that going to do for me? See, it's easy to just do it by yourself, right? To say, this is what I believe, and that's what I'm going to do. Those famous words, my conscience won't allow me to do that. Well, what does God's Word say? Does your conscience allow you to obey God's Word? To be in worship every week and not every once in a while? To be taken hold of the means of grace daily, not just once in a while? What do you do? What do you choose? See, it's easy to go your own way. It's much harder to submit to God's way. To submit yourself to God's leaders, to His Word, to go His way. But you need to ask yourself, not which is easier, but which way leads to life. Because Christ is urging you, imploring upon you, choose life. The narrow gate may seem more difficult and harder. Less people might be on it. It might be lonelier to walk down, but it's the better option. It's the one that leads to life. Why would you take a path that you know leads to death? That makes no sense. So do what Jesus says here. Choose life. Choose the narrow gate and find life. Do this because you know you've been blessed. And there's so many people who can't even find the narrow gate. Which leads us to our third and final point. Choose the narrow gate. Back in 1977, the U.S. Marine Corps, they changed their slogan. They changed it to say, the few, the proud, the Marines. And this slogan was intended to show something, to convey a message. It was basically to say, Marines are head above everyone else. Anyone could be in the Army, the Navy, or the Coast Guard, but it takes a special breed, a special person to be a Marine. And I saw this kind of lived out through my friend. He was in the navies. He was in the Seabees in the Navy back in 1989, 1990. This was during the Persian Gulf War buildup. Remember those days when they're building up, anticipating that Persian War? Persian War? Well, I asked him, you're a builder. You're in the Seabees. What do you do if war breaks out? I remember what he said. He said, I grab my rifle, I hide under my bed, and wait for the Marines to show up. It kind of illustrates what happens, right? The few, the proud, the Marines. Well, Christ is saying the same thing for you. He's saying, be part of the few, the proud, the Christian, those who belong to Jesus Christ. Choose the narrow gate, because that's what helps make you part of the few. And that's what you see right here. Look at verse 14, how it begins. Look what he says here. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. This shows the difficulty with choosing the narrow gate. That's why Jesus starts back in verse 13 saying, enter by the narrow gate. He wants you to choose the narrow gate, but he knows it's hard. Look again, you have a four. For the third time in our text now, you see a four. And what's this one showing? Why people choose the wide gate over the narrow gate. Because the wide gate leads to an easy road. But the narrow gate leads to a way that's hard, that's difficult. And the word translated hard here actually comes from a Greek word meaning to oppress or persecute. It's the idea that the road to Christians travel is a difficult 
arduous journey, one filled with persecution and disdain. Your relatives and your friends who were so close to you, so loving to you, may suddenly see you as an enemy when God changes you and makes you new. You ever experience that? God draws you to himself and makes you new and suddenly people who were your best friends, your best relatives, suddenly start casting you off, want nothing to do with you anymore because now you're a weirdo. That often keeps us from the narrow gate. Maybe some of you here this morning are struggling with just that. You're saying, you know what, I know the narrow gate leads to life, but I don't want to take it because what I might lose. Well, understand, you gain so much more, more than you ever wind up losing. That's why Jesus says, take the narrow gate, even though the way is hard, because it leads to life. Whatever you lose in this life is so worth losing. You know why? Because when you gain Christ, you gain everything, and not just eternity, but so much more temporally. Matthew 19, 29 says it like this. Everyone who's left homes or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold in this life and eternal life to come. That's what Jesus has in mind here. He's saying that's why you want to choose the narrow gate. It may lead to a hard path, but it's a better path. If you choose life, it'll come at a cost. But it also has a great reward. You may lose friends, relatives, some delicacies and delights, maybe a job, maybe some comfort, maybe some ease, but you gain so much more. Because think about it. If you choose life, you're not going through that wide gate and easy path that leads to destruction, but you're going through the narrow gate that leads to life. That's the idea. Think about it. You follow the path that Jesus first trod for you. He goes from what? From cross to crown. And so do you. He goes from suffering to glory. And so do you. What's he do? He has to give up his throne in heaven. Take humanity to himself. Become what he wasn't. So you might become what you're not. He serves as the one mediator between God and man. So you might have access to God opened up. He's the gate you enter through to have access to God. That's what brings you into your eternity. Through Jesus Christ. See, the world tells you there's many ways to God. Just be true to yourself. God says, no, be true to his word. Listen to what he says. Don't go the easy, wide path. Go the narrow path that leads to life. Because what does Christ do? He's raised from the grave, ascends on high, so you can be brought from death to life, out of the darkness into the light. That's the idea. See, it's like this. You can't have the glory without the guts. That's the idea. You'll only receive the crown by first carrying the cross. So what will you do? Will you choose to carry that heavy cross on your back? Or you say, I'm gonna lay it down and go the easy way. Understand, the path may be hard, it may be more difficult, but look where it leads. It leads not to death and destruction, but to life. A life that you can never lose. A life that's guaranteed for all the test of time. That's why, again, you wanna choose life. And know that Christ doesn't ask you to do anything that he doesn't first do for you. He lays down his life so you may be brought to saving faith, so you might live for him. So what do you choose when you're facing those forks in the road? Which way do you go? He's making it clear that far too many people are on that wide and easy path because they don't want to face carrying their cross. They don't want to face persecution and suffering. But Jesus makes it clear, if you do that for his sake, you get so much more. And you see this in the way verse 14 concludes. Look what it says here. And those who find it are few. This shows why so, why so few people choose the narrow gate. Jesus is making clear, he says, choose the narrow gate. But it takes effort and work. It's hard. It's more difficult. You may have to search it out. You may have to struggle to get through it and stay on that path. And this can be a bit confusing, can it? It almost seems like we choose Jesus, but that's not what he's saying here. John 6, makes clear. No one comes to Jesus unless the Father who sent him draws him, and the Greek word actually means drags him. So God chooses you. You don't choose him. But once he chooses you, now you've got work to do. You've got a path that he puts you on, and you just struggle to stay on it because the world keeps calling you away. Come over here. Look how wide the path is. Look how easy it is. Look how good your life could be. Put money first, and you'll have everything you need. Every desire will be met, except the one that you can't buy, your eternity. 
with Jesus Christ. Think about this. You were, you're called to do what? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So ask yourself, are you willing to be mocked and scorned for your Christian beliefs? Are you willing to lose parents and children for the sake of gaining Christ? Are you willing to walk away from all you know and love if you get new life in Jesus Christ? Will you live a life of persecution, a life of suffering, a life of disdain, if that's what God calls you to do, to gain assurance of eternity with Jesus Christ? What if following Christ means you have to give up all the world has to offer? Will you do it? What will you choose? If you're here this morning and you've never chosen Christ, then pray to God now. Ask Him to help you to confess your sins, repent, and turn and trust in Him. And if you've done that, then ask God to help you to stay on that path. To stay walking with Him. Because on your own, you just can't do it. But you've got the Spirit indwelling you. That's why He ascends, so the Spirit can descend and indwell you and make you new. So you can choose life. That's what Jesus is urging you to do here this morning. So what will you do? What will you choose? Will you be one of the few, the chosen, the Christian? Maybe like everyone else who's on the wide path. Choose the narrow gate. And find life. That's what he's laying out right here. Because there's no greater reward than an eternity with your triune God. Worshiping and serving your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No matter what it costs, you should always be willing to choose life. So do just that. Choose the narrow gate and find life. In this life, we always face choices. We come to those forks in the road. And we have to choose. And sadly, all too often, even... Believers, firm in their faith, wind up choosing the wide gate and easy path. Because we don't consider where it leads to. So Jesus is urging to think about not just the circumstances or situation, but he's saying think about the consequences. Think about what happens as a result of the choices you make. And that's why he's saying don't choose the wide gate, but choose the narrow gate, who is Christ himself. The one who enters, enables you to have entrance to God, to his kingdom. That's the idea. He's the narrow gate that leads to life. It may mean you face persecution and hardship in this life, but it's oh so worth going through for what you gain in the end. Your best friend, your closest relative, may want nothing more to do with you. But if Christ says, well done, good and faithful servant, isn't that all worth it at the end? Isn't that what you're striving for? And there's nothing better than that. So choose life. Know there's nothing this world has to offer that can compare to what Christ gives you, both now and in the life to come. That should help you to see why you want to choose life, why you want to walk through the narrow gate. It may be hard, hard to find, difficult to walk through, but it's the way that leads to life. And Christ is urging you to do just that, to choose life. So hear what he's telling you this morning. Choose the narrow gate and find life. Let's pray. Please join me. Lord God, we come before you this morning thanking you and praising you that you put before us a choice of life and death. The same choice you set before your people of old, Lord. And Lord, because your covenantal promises, we can choose life. We can choose the narrow gate. So help us, Lord, as we face these fork roads in life, help us always to choose life, Lord. Help us to choose the narrow gate knowing that leads to life. We ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen.